Brene Brown talks about people that would rather live in disappointed than experience disappointment, right? Because you've allowed yourself to believe, to dream, to expect something could happen. I also hear in my mind, people go, well, hope's not a strategy. Hope's not a strategy. My response now is, no, but it sure is a skill. Right? <laughs> it, it may not be a strategy, but hope is a skill. And I don't want anybody pushing a strategy that doesn't have an ounce of hope in it. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the Sparks of Gratitude podcast. We are grateful for you. You know, you could be listening to anything else today, but you chose to listen to us. This conversation is very important to us. We're so excited to have it with you and our special guest today. Remember, gratitude saves lives, and that is our choice. We get to choose gratitude. Well, today, let's welcome to the conversation an amazing guest, Mr. Kevin Monroe. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Randy. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited that we're having a conversation. So Randy and I were just chatting a moment and talking about this isn't an interview. Folks, I I love that there is nothing scripted about what you're about to hear. And is it okay that we say that, Randy? (laughs) I think it's great. Well, it takes the pressure off of me, that's for sure. Yeah. And I love that you mentioned just how many podcasts there are. And the fact, I, I always say that as a guest, if the host doesn't. Thank you for choosing to listen to this now. And there's something really magical, maybe even, you know, divine that directed you here to be part of this conversation today. And I love it to think that you're part of this conversation. Join us uh, and, and let's just have fun for however long we riff here. Well, let's make it happen. Guys, Kevin Monroe, the gratitude guy, he, he's known as the gratitude guy, right? And if you look him up, if you go check out LinkedIn, he's really active, does a lot of positive posts and inviting gratitude. And in fact, that's where Kevin and I met. But there's there's a great story for how Kevin became the gratitude guy, and he didn't mean to. This <laughs> happened to him. And Kevin, would you kind of give the background and the story of how you became the gratitude guy? Ooh, yeah, yeah. Um And that's a fun place to start, Randy. And it really is interesting that I have become known as the gratitude guy. And that was never an aspiration. It was really a bit of an accident. And it goes back to a dark morning in my life, April 17th. And it's one of the, in my gratitude journey, more than any other part of my life, there are a lot of dates that I happen to remember. And the first one was April 17th, 2018. And that was the morning when I, struggled to get out of bed. You know, and I don't mind saying this morning, uh, I, I've been up since 317 this morning. There's a project I'm working on that was exciting. There was this conversation that I was anticipating and I just got up early and started. And I'm usually up between 430 and 5, 515 without an alarm clock. And that's been the story of my life. But that morning, April 17th, I could not get out of bed. I was... I was in despair. I was in a dark place. And I've had enough experience with depression, a couple of bouts as an adult, that I knew I was on that slippery slope. And I knew if I did, if there wasn't an intervention, Randy, right? Who knows how deep you may go or how long you may be there. And I know some of you listening know exactly what I'm talking about. You've experienced that. And can I just say, I hope you're not experiencing that now. And if you are, I, I invite you to reach out to me because and I'll tell you how to do that later in the, the uh, well, as a matter of fact, I'll just do it now. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pull the Bob Golf card. <laughs> 404-713-0713. Text me, call me. If you are in that place, you don't need to stay there. And if you're really in that dark place, call the suicide helpline if it's that dark, right? I'm not a professional counselor. But that morning, I was just in this dark place. But I had started a journey, 
at the suggestion of a mentor, the invitation of a mentor about two years before of, he said, Kevin, would you join me in praying 15 minutes a day? And I'm like, gosh, I haven't prayed 15 minutes in a year. That's a big ask, buddy. But I started that journey and it's just a time of listening, opening your heart, your mind to, to God, to the divine. As, as you may not uh, call him God, I do. Um, in that morning, I called out in prayer. There was nothing to pray when I drug my fanny out of bed like 7.45 that morning. Finally, roll over, come into my office, grab my journal, sit down, and am feeling nothing but emptiness and despair. But I called out in prayer, and I prayed, and I have it written right here. I, mean, I can actually show you. I, I've just It comes up so much that I just keep it on my desk. And, and there's the actual journal, and I prayed. Holy Spirit, you are the creative spark of the universe, spark creativity in me. And what came in that next moment or in the moments that followed about 45 minutes later was this idea to launch a 13 week, 90 day journey. We called it the extraordinary experiment. And maybe some of you listening can relate to this as well. When I look in the mirror, what I see looking back at me is as ordinary of a guy as I can imagine. Right. I mean, I am not super smart. I, I got put in the gifted program and then I think they wanted to take me out because they realized that was a mistake. I wasn't athletic. I was always the last kid chosen. I was chubby. I was short. Right. Just so none of that. But from the time I was 13 years old until this day, I've wanted to, I wanted it to matter that I lived, Randy. I want to live an extraordinary life. So we called this, I had this idea for the extraordinary experiment. What are things we can do with extra? And we didn't even have this language then. This language evolved over the, the weeks. Uh, extra focus, fervor, and flair that all of a sudden ordinary things become extraordinary just by the way we do them. So week six, I remember I remember a lot of the weeks not in order. Re week one was simply the awareness challenge. We were inviting people to be aware of who and what's around you rather than self-absorbed. And week six was the gratitude challenge. Mm. And when we started to introduce week six, it was the first time in my life that I pondered the question, are being thankful and being grateful the same thing? Because up until that point in my life, I had assumed they were. And all of a sudden I'm realizing, gosh, I don't think they are. And so we, we launched this and it was amazing, this 13 week journey. And I'll fast forward. So going into June of 2019, June 17th, in my morning prayer time, I heard these words, host a gratitude challenge. I'm like, well, gosh, that's an interesting idea. It's not anything I had ever considered, right? There was no strategic plan behind this. It was just like host a gratitude challenge. So I called two friends and asked, would they join me to do this? Because, you know, it's so much easier to start something new with somebody rather than do it alone. That's just a little nugget there that I'll drop. Maybe somebody needs to hear that because if you're trying to do something and, and maybe it seems audacious to you, well, gosh, maybe even the host of this show relates to this. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because you had an idea for doing this show a long time before you actually took action on it. Right. right. <laughs> So that morning, June 17th, I have this idea, host a gratitude challenge. I call my two friends. We, we agree to do this. Three weeks, two and a half weeks later, we've launched one, Randy. And we, we announce it on July 2nd, 2019 to launch on July 8th, 2019. And then we realize that's the week of July 4th. And how silly is it to try to recruit? So we worked like crazy to, to find 100 people to join us. And then on Saturday, July 6th, a friend hears about this and he goes, hey, Kevin, can I post this in my Twitter community? I'm like, of course you can, Steve. Steve Brown, an amazing human. In 46 hours, 194 additional people sign up. So we're running this as a closed cohort to do some research around it. And the next day, we've noticed there are 100 people raising their hands saying, we want in. Now, Randy, I honestly don't know if I had ever thought about doing more than one. It's certainly, well, maybe two. So we ran the second one. The second one started with 349 people. 
we ended up running 22 sessions of this gratitude challenge. We had over 2,800 unique people join from 73 countries of the world. Wow. And somewhere in that journey, I became the gratitude guy, right? There were a lot of things that had piqued my interest before. And the day I realized I had become the gratitude guy, Tracy Fenton, the CEO and founder of World Blue, had asked me, would I do a session for her global leadership cohort? I said, you know, I will, Tracy. What do you want me to do it on? And Tracy said, duh, gratitude. And in that moment, in her mind, Randy, there was not another topic that would be interesting for Kevin Monroe to come talk about, except gratitude. And I'm like, oh, oh, I've become the gratitude guy. That was the first moment you realized that <laughs> you were that guy. It was. I mean, it was just, you know, it was just one of these things I was doing. I had done a lot of work around culture. I'd done a lot of work around servant leadership and leadership and purpose. And all of those things were fascinating to me. But when somebody goes, oh, no, we want you to come talk about gratitude. And then the response I had really shaped what would come in the, the years that have followed since. I was like, oh, Tracy, I would love to share with your group about gratitude. But a webinar? Because that's what she says. Would you do a webinar? I don't know. If you're talking about me coming on and being a talking head for 45 minutes on the virtues and the values and why you should be grateful, I don't want to do that. And she goes, well, what will you do? I said, I don't know. Let me find, you know, let, let me think about it. And a couple of weeks later, I'm on a morning walk in our neighborhood and this idea pops, Randy. And the idea popped. It's built on a concept. The concept is that gratitude experienced is better than gratitude explained. And and I don't want to attempt to be a neuroscientist or a PhD because I'm neither, right? And come talk about what happens in your brain and in your body when you express gratitude because I had attended a lot of those sessions and those lectures. And at the end of the lecture, I'd be sitting there, you know, stroking my beard thinking, well, maybe, maybe gratitude's a good thing. I should try it someday. I was like, what if we just flip that? What if we create an experience and we invite people in and we get people experiencing and expressing gratitude? With no explanation about it, right? we just get pe expose people to it. And that's what we started doing. And Randy, I have been doing that uh, for four years on a monthly basis uh, ever since. Just creating environment. We call it a gratitude encounter. Right. I'm aware of these. And your next, you do these once a month, every four weeks. You can find them on your website if you look up at kevindmonroe.com. We'll put links yeah. to, in this podcast. And people can sign up to to be part of those first yeah. tuesday of every month 12 noon eastern time first tuesday of every month unless the first tuesday falls on some kind of weird day you know like january 1st we'd move it and we moved it on july 4th but it's usually the first tuesday of the month 12 noon and i don't have any plans of stopping those at this point it's just become such a beautiful place and randy it's it, you know i didn't realize this either it's like a laboratory and it's in those environments and the environments that have fund out of those where I've observed so much. So, so here's one thing. Here are two things I observed. We'll just see if these spark, if these spark anything. There you go. Spark. Gratitude is better together. When, Tell me when, more. When we, launched, when we launched our very first gratitude challenge, we were sending emails. And it was just a prompt in an email. It was a creative prompt, but it was still just email. And we discovered we were having challenges getting emails to people's devices, right? And our email provider gets involved and it's like, oh, you're getting to the server. We're doing our job. It's just all the filtering that corporate America now has and now everybody has through the email provider where certain messages don't make it to your inbox. So we're trying to figure out this technical problem and we landed on a community solution that allowed us to host in an app. And now all of a sudden, when people were responding to a prompt, 
they're sharing their response in a community. And now all of a sudden, other people are building on their response or reacting to their response. Oh, me too. Or right. And it was just like, wow, gratitude is better together. It grows exponentially when we get into groups and express responses to whatever the gratitude prompt is. It grows. Well, I there's so much in there in that story and how the story of how you became the gratitude guy and you host these these gratitude encounters to share, gratitude shared and experienced together is better than than the alternative. What are some of the things that you've learned from that, from those encounters that may have surprised you or that are maybe some of the most impactful moments? So another one is, and I this happened in the second month that I started hosting these regularly. Well, okay, well, I'll, I'll back up and I'll say the first month. The first month... <laughs> When I finished the very first session, a friend of mine that was there, he says, Kevin, you know, this is a commercially viable service, don't you? Right. Like I should. And I'm like, no, is it? <laughs> and, and will you help me create that? And so, Randy, we took this idea, right, that, that was a truly a spark of divine inspiration and created this thing. And six weeks later, we had our first corporate client signing up for it. And the amazing things that happened in that session, and I'll come back and talk about a couple of those in a moment. But then within, in less than a year, on the same day, we received signed contracts from two of the biggest companies on the planet to do gratitude work with them, PepsiCo and Pfizer. And it was like, how is this happening? Because I would not know how, I wouldn't know what door to go knock on at either of those companies to go, hey, are you interested in a gratitude program? But they heard about these programs and they wanted to bring them into their companies. And it was like, this is amazing, right? So the fact that gratitude has, I'll just, gratitude has immense, enormous value to companies and leaders of companies. That was a real, you know, eye-opening thing to me. Another one was how quickly and deeply strangers connect around the gratitude table. This, this happened in our second session. And I mean, we just put these out there. We still put these out there today. Now we have some people, I call them frequent flyers, right? They're people that come as often as they can. And, and okay, so let me, here's another learning. And now every gratitude encounter is a little bit different. They're very similar in structure, but we usually pick a thing. But in July and August, because of a reason, we had we had done a 31-day program in July. I used the exact same questions and prompts in July and August, and the experience was completely different, right? So there, there's this epiphany that even though you don't step into the same river twice, right? That that's saying you can you can ask the same gratitude question, and because we've all had different experiences, because they're different people in the room, it changes. But that that very second meeting, people somebody posted because I'm always collecting feedback, and at the end somebody posted, "We arrived as strangers, leaving as friends," and. Randy, I, I, I mean, that's a, that, to me, that's, you bring people together, you you tee up a, a conversation around gratitude, you give them a prompt, put them in a room and let them share. And people share deeply. They share quickly. They share openly. And the other thing, you know, four years in, no jerks have showed up yet. <laughs> I don't understand, right? I mean, so there's something about the law of attraction. This kind of topic attracts people who are open to it. Last month, that's July, a lady showed up. She knows no one in the room. She has no idea how she even got the announcement, but it intrigued her. She came. She's like, oh my gosh, these concepts all feel so familiar, right? And I love the conversations we have. And I didn't know a soul in the room. Well, so tell me a little bit about what those encounters are like. What's the format? Okay. And 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 how does this conversation begin? Because you you say that I mean they're so successful, and you're not going to stop doing them be because they're so effective. But what's it like? 
so the okay so i use a tool every month I, I it's become my favorite tool i learned i met this tool uh it's mentimeter m e n t i m e t e r and i am not a paid endorser for mentimeter i was serving a client in norway in 2016 and we were doing a large group meeting and they said hey we have this new tool would you be interested in using it i'm like sure what is it? Yeah. And, and I found it and I used it. It was so successful because what Mentimeter allows are people in it, to people to respond to questions on a slide anonymously and they can respond. So we do some surveys, multiple choice. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I've just I've landed on a question I love asking. I asked this question in the opening. What song title? And it's not necessary that you know the tune nor the lyrics. What song title best describes your current relationship with gratitude? Ooh, interesting question. And then some of the choices are uh, oh, on the positive side. I'm a believer. Um, I need you now. Uh, don't stop believing. And then, then there's somebody I used to know. Interesting. Then there's, we've only just begun and strangers in the night. I think those are the choices I usually, yeah, those are the choices, right? So I always love it. My favorite response to see somebody answer is somebody I used to know. And whenever that comes up on a screen, I just say, hey, this is completely anonymous. I have no idea who responded to that. I just want you to know, I'd love to hear your story. If there's some time after today that you want to share it with me, find me. I want to hear your story. And they're usually themes to those stories. And the theme right. is loss. The, mm. the theme is major setback, disappointment, right? That I was a grateful person and then this happened in my life and it just pulled the rug out from under me. I love it when there are people that go strangers in the night and yet they show up at an event like this. And then something else we started doing and Randy, it's kind of crazy because I started doing this before things happened in the world. Uh, now, this was post-COVID. So when I started all of this, it was pre-COVID. But I started measuring hope in January of 2021. And I don't know why. But, well, I do know why. Hope is a really important topic to me. Hope grows in gratitude. And I have I have. Uh, lots of data to show that because what we do, we ask people this question and I ask it two ways. Over the preceding seven days, what's your level of hope uh, on, you know, petrol gauge or fuel gauge, zero to 10, empty to full. What's your level of hope and what's your hope now? OK, because there's something that in those numbers always, always vary. And with the exception of three times, the seven day number is always lower than in the moment. And part of that, I believe, is because in the moment, people have come into a friendly space. They've been welcomed. They see a bunch of smiling faces because we use Zoom and we invite people to come camera on and tell people you're going to be interacting. So they've, you know, by the time they've answering this question, they've already had a little bit of, I guess, oxytocin flowing, right? And some of the, the, the happy hormones flowing in their body, an endorphin rush. So the number is a little higher in the moment over the preceding seven days. And then I always look because I love when you hover in, you can actually see the breakout of numbers. And there are times, there, there's almost always a time somebody shows up with, with very low levels of hope because it's a tough time in the world still. Four years past COVID, it's still a tough time. There's so much uncertainty. There's so much toxicity in the world. So then I share, hey, hope grows in gratitude right? That's the good news. And then we go through, and, and then I say some things to introduce gratitude to people that may not know what we're talking about, get people comfortable with Mentimeter. And then I introduce, hey, here's today's topic. And then I go, round one, here's the question. And we tee it up. And then we have a very specific question. And then we put people in very small breakout groups, three to four mm, okay. people in a group, right? And then they go and process that question as a group. And then they come back and we use Mentimeter to allow people to report out anything you heard that you think everybody should hear. And maybe a couple of people will share something that just amazed them that they heard in the room. And then round two, it's always similar, but a different prompt. 
we get people in the moment to whatever the prompt is. So prompts may be like somebody that's brightened your day or lightened your load this week. And if you were to think, you know, somebody come to mind. Okay, everybody got somebody in mind. All right. So what we're going to do right now, we're going to take two minutes and we're all going to message that person and tell them thanks and express our gratitude to them. Yeah, it's powerful. Powerful to do that. It's powerful. And I've done this hundreds of times at this point. And I, okay, one stands out, uh, a couple stand out, but my friend, and she doesn't mind me saying this, my friend Kiki, first time she came, she comes back, it was, so comes back on camera, and in just a minute, she it, she said it, she's ugly crying. She texted her father and thanked him for so much, and, and his response just moved her to tears, right? And that kind of stuff happens. Okay, another one, my friend Vicky text a coworker and this coworker is highly successful highly affluent mid 40s and she she responds and then she calls Vicky crying and says no one no one has ever told me they're grateful for me isn't that interesting yeah, How powerful that, that is that to, for someone to hear that i was in a group where we did that exercise once and it was so fun because, you know, first it, the, the invitation to message that person wasn't given at the beginning. It was, you know, think of somebody. And, and so, you know, that was brought to mind and I was feeling, I was feeling the gratitude and imagining that person and it was kind of growing in my heart, right. And expanding. And, and then it was now message that person and tell them. And it was really fun to hear the responses that people received afterwards and people, you know, raise their hands and shared those. And some of them were funny. They were, you know, the response was, are you dying? <laughs> <laughs> or, or the beautiful ones that bring people to tears. And even the ones that were, are you dying? Were, were also positive. They, but it, it just seemed out of the ordinary that it's not in many people's common conversation to express that sincere gratitude. And this is where I think the togetherness, showing that compassion, that gratitude will expand and connect us so much better. Okay, so so continue. This is part of your no, process no, in these encounters. Okay. No, we always, and so we do that about halfway point so that people can hear back. And so mm-hmm. before the end, you know, hey, did anybody get a, a response you want to share? And the, that's when those responses come. And I mean, no one, no one has ever said, don't text me again, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, not interested, don't want, stop. I don't want that kind of text. It's always moving. It's always connecting. Uh, and then we do another round of conversations, right? And let people, so there's a second round. And and sometimes they go in a different group. Sometimes they may stay in the same group to go deeper. It, it, we mix it up. And then we come back and then we, we're starting to wind down and Uh, Two things I always do at the end. We measure hope again. Now, Randy, this is 45, 50 minutes after we just measured hope, right? Mm -hmm. It's always, always more. And this last month, I was like, oh my gosh, in August, I was wondering, because the level of hope in this group was 8.9 in the moment. And I'm like, out of 10? Out of 10, at the beginning, it's 8.9. And I just remember thinking, oh, this, this might be the first time, right? When it was over, 9.9. So they, that, that's been the trend that once, once people begin the gratitude process and that, that feeling grows, then hope. Hope rises. Follows. Hope, hope rises. There, mm. there, there is this level of hope. And I will tell you, I mean, the first time I, I heard Danielle Strickland, who's with the Salvation Army. She was doing a a, a, a talk uh, at a church and I heard her there and she said, hope is cultivated in the soil of gratitude. And I was like, oh, that's fascinating. I re- and then when I started a podcast, I had Danielle, and this was not a gratitude podcast. This is before I was doing gratitude work. She was one of my first guests and we talked about that, right? And so now I just say hope grows in gratitude. And I watched it every month for four years now that it, it grows. And then we always also ask, 
use the word cloud and ask people because I love people. I love seeing people's own words, right? Not you choose a word, write a word. What word or phrase best describes your experience here today? And it, it it's just mind blowing. Yeah. It, what it, powerful information to see for you to see the fruits of that experience from different perspectives. Yeah. And I mean, it's a few months ago, there was one, I'm like, well, that's interesting. So sometimes I'll ask, Hey, you know, it's anonymous, but if if somebody that wrote this, something, it was something like better than expected. (laughs) And I'm like, Oh, okay. So what were you expecting? And, and it was somebody who had joined for the first time. It was somebody from France. They had wanted to join for months but they were such an introvert by their own admission that this seemed like, ooh, I don't know, about putting myself in that kind of setting, right? And then she said, oh, it's better than I expected, right? Because she just didn't know what to expect. And being an introvert, being in a group of people and and being, in, and, and that's another thing. We always, people are invited to share. You don't have to share, right? Maybe somebody's not in a place that they can share. So So everything's by invitation. And that's, oh, well, that's another big learning, Randy, is the power of invitation. And every one of us, everyone listening to this conversation, you have the power of invitation. You can invite someone. And I finally learned this. Even after I was using invitation language, I had a conversation with a friend one day and she goes, well, why didn't you invite me to something? An event? She goes, I said, because you're too busy. She goes, let me decide that. Right. And if we invite People, yes, no, not now, are all equally valid answers, right? If if you invite somebody and they go, no, that does not detract from the power of the invitation. And we know from psychology, sales, other things, some people may take seven, eight, nine invitations before they respond. So keep inviting people. But we all have this power to just invite somebody. Hey, I I, I, I found a restaurant. You want to come try it with us, right? Whatever it is, we just invite people. And when we invite graciously and generously, amazing things happen. And, you know, my experience is that when someone invites me to something, I feel appreciated. I feel valued. And even if my answer is, oh, I'm so sorry, I cannot, I can't attend with you, I still feel the, the love and appreciation of the person who invited me. Okay, Kevin, you mentioned a couple things in this, in this story that have just made my mind go. And so I want to um, talk to you about this. I love so much the, the interest in hope and the value of hope and how hope grows in gratitude. This is a, a concept that I'm so fascinated with. And then you commented on somebody's experience with the with attending the the workshop, the 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 event. Yeah. yeah, the encounter. They said better than expected. Okay, so here's two contrasting words that I want to ask you what your what your perspective is on it. Hope versus expectation. This is something I've been ruminating on for a couple of years, and I can give you my thoughts on it. But I, but I'd like to hear what if that sparks any any thought in your mind and then I can tell you what 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 I've been thinking about lately with those two words. Get the expectation when you're hoping for something that doesn't happen, that doesn't happen and it doesn't happen. And now, okay, so I, I, I hadn't thought of this in a long time. I have a friend, Rick Rigsby, who wrote a book, Afraid to Hope, right? Because People have dealt with so much disappointment and they've hoped for so many things. And when they didn't happen, now they're afraid to hope anymore, right? Because gosh, if it does, I, and and Brene Brown talks about this. Brene Brown talks about people that would rather live in disappointed than experience disappointment, right? Because you've, you've allowed yourself to believe, to dream, to expect something could happen. And so you just, oh, no, no, it's not going to happen for me. That may happen for others, right? So that's part of hope. But I, okay, so I also hear in my mind, people go, well, hope's not a strategy. Hope's not a strategy. And I, my response now is, no, but it sure is a skill. 
right? <laughs> it may not be a strategy, but hope is a skill. And I don't want anybody pushing a strategy that doesn't have an ounce of hope in it. I'm not interested. I can't go a day without hope. I mean, I'm, if, if I don't have hope, I am in the darkest of dark and it's despair, right? We have to have hope. Hope that tomorrow may be better than today, right? And and despair, I heard this definition. The, the definition of despair is tomorrow will be no better today, maybe even worse, right? That's despair. So expectation, it, it's attributed to Shakespeare. I read somewhere else that Shakespeare didn't say this, but expectation is the root of all disappointment, mm-hmm. right? So how do we have disappointment? It's because we created an expectation, whether it's realistic or unrealistic, but we had some kind of expectation that didn't happen. And when it doesn't happen, and oh, I've had a lot of those in my life, by the way. <laughs> so let me, I mean, okay, we're talking about some things that did work. I've launched a lot of things in the gratitude space that didn't work, right? So here's one. I had a friend, a business friend, a friend in business, an influential person in business said, hey, Kevin, this is two years ago, you know, you should create an app. If you had an app, we'd bring it into our company and, and we'd, we'd promote it and share it and go crazy. I'm like, that'd be awesome. Week late, two weeks later, I'm talking to somebody and they go, oh, you got to meet my friend. So October of uh, 2022, yeah, we, we I meet this guy that can develop an app. We develop an app. We launch it in early 2023. And right as we're launching it, something changes on their platform. And now the app can't do what I was hoping it would do. But we launch an app and I put money, time, effort, energy into this app. And it just doesn't produce the results I've wanted. And it is, an more than anything, it is an energy drain, right? And and, and a money drain. And so the end of 2023, I knew I was going to pull the plug. We pulled the plug going into 2024. That's just not, we weren't going to do that anymore. But there was a lot of disappointment about that, right? Because I had expectation. And when I said this company, this company is one of the largest companies on the planet. And if they would promote your app inside their company, it would be amazing. And then all of a sudden the app doesn't deliver. So yeah. I know disappointment. So yeah, what are your- the, those are great <laughs> examples. So I've been, I've had this conversation with people. I'm still kind of collecting my my thoughts around this. I've read what other people say about hope. I have a a close friend who who's doing really great work. His name's Curtis Morley on something called counterfeit emotions. And and there's these dyads of authentic emotions versus a counterfeit that masquerades as an authentic emotion, but it actually is kind of negatively affects us. And um, one of these dyads, I'll I'll use his terminology in in authentic versus counterfeit to explain my thoughts on hope versus expectation. I feel in some some sense that hope can be, or that that expectation is a counterfeit of hope, Mm. where expectation is where I have set some, some, somehow I've set some arbitrary line that is to be realized. And if it's not- timeline too probably right which i've created somehow (laughs) and if it's not realized i am disappointed but here's the the fun part well not necessarily fun but what if it is achieved what is my best case scenario mere satisfaction Mm. because it was supposed to happen yeah right but what if it's hope what if i trade that expectation for hope Mm. and then I am hoping for something. And if it is realized, it's I'm ecstatic. Okay, so hope deferred makes the heart sick. The rest of that proverb is, but a desire realized is a tree of life. And that's right. what you're talking about. And so right? this is what this is how, how I'm imagining this. And so I'm saying, okay, well, in some cases, expectation can really be a toxic mm. um, thing. And so I've been analyzing and noticing in myself, anytime I feel disappointed, I pause. And what I think back and I say, well, what was my expectation? Yeah. And then I call myself out on, I was disappointed because I had arbitrarily set some expectation and try to say, well, what can I learn from this in how I engage with life in relationships in, in whatever it may be. So, 
So you just mentioned hope and expectation. So I, I thought I'd invite you to, to comment on that. And so, so thank you. Well, let me add one more hope and optimism. Uh, because I describe myself as a perpetual optimist. I, I don't know when that started because I didn't necessarily grow up with that, but I am just perpetually optimistic. But the difference between optimism and hope, I believe, is this. Optimism is a generalized belief that things will turn out okay or turn turn out well. Hope is the belief there's something I can do that impacts that. Wow, I like that. Yeah, that that's awesome. Okay. I want to pivot just a little bit um, okay. because you mentioned um, before we got started on this conversation, in fact, I think it was earlier to, today you had a conversation with somebody and part of that conversation was finding gratitude through grief. And yeah. I'd love to yeah. hear your thoughts because when you do gratitude challenges, I've, I've had somebody, actually the seed of this podcast was planted with Dr. Paul Jenkins who was a positive psychologist and challenged my wife and myself a dozen years ago to keep to have a gratitude practice. But a major part of that was find gratitude in the hard stuff. And that's difficult. For example, I had a kind of a nasty bike crash a few weeks ago. And I don't know, some of the photos are a little gruesome with blood and, you know, <laughs> things. And it was pretty scary. A few inches different could have been fatal. And I walked away with bumps and bruises, and I can't really use my right arm very well right now. It's healing. But my ego and my arm and bruises will heal, and my stitches have healed my face. But even through that recent experience, I remember feeling just this sense of gratitude, laying in the hospital and looking at my wife and being grateful that she's standing there next to me, that I walked into the hospital and I walked out of it. And while I was in the hospital, I heard another patient had passed away in the emergency room. And this perspective I was feeling of, I have life, I have love, I have all my limbs, I can walk in and out. I'm not moving as quick as I did the day before, but finding gratitude through grief. Or what if it's a bankruptcy? What if it's loss of a spouse or a child through tragic circumstances? What? So how? what's your experience seeing this as, or experiencing it yourself? with yeah. gratitude through grief. Well, uh, let's start with the phrase you just used, because I believe that's key. Gratitude through grief, not gratitude for grief. Mm. Yeah. Right? I mean, th right there, is a, that, that's a pretty significant difference, right? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to bring in another topic that gets some people worked up, right? It, it, toxic positivity. And some people are so quick to say, well, that gratitude stuff, that's toxic positivity. And I'm like, no, it's not. Now, there may be people that teach gratitude as toxic positivity, but gratitude in and of itself is not toxic positivity. Gratitude is not saying, and, and you know, hey, be grateful for everything. You know, you, no, what, what, that is toxic positivity. Your, your, your spouse died, your child died, and somebody has the, audacity to say you should be grateful for that yeah that's hard to hear and and they probably deserve a punch in the face i mean <laughs> I, I, right I mean, be grateful for this <laughs> yeah yeah, I mean, yeah let me show you some credit be grateful yeah but the the idea okay so i'm i'm going to reference a book and it's not a book about gratitude but it's a book by my friend brad aronson humankind Brad's wife was diagnosed, maybe it was leukemia. It was going to it was going to be a long, prolonged treatment and recovery. And their medical team told them, you must find something good to focus on in this journey or you will go crazy. You'll lose your mind. And what they chose to focus on was all the kindness mm. that was demonstrated to them through this journey, right? So they're not grateful for what's happening, but in spite of all of that tragic stuff happening, wow, people were incredibly kind. People were incredibly thoughtful. People were doing things for them. One of the stories he tells is that they missed the deadline for summer camp to get their son in summer camp. Somebody goes, oh, I'll handle it. 
what he finds out is that person took their kid out of camp to make the spot for their child to go to camp. Wow. <sighs> right? Does that evoke gratitude? Right? So you, when you and I, so Randy and I've met once before. We had a conversation. Like I said, we could have recorded that. That would have been a great podcast. But we talked about um, some people we know. One of those is my dear friend, Chester Elton, whom you know. You've had him on the podcast. Yep. When, when COVID hit, Chester and, and his team, they just come up with this hashtag the first or second week of COVID called Find Your Gratitude. And Chester and I started hosting weekly events to support people. And, and we were so naive. We said, oh, we'll do this throughout COVID. We didn't realize COVID was going to be a forever thing, right? We did it for 90 or 120 days. But sometimes you have to find gratitude. You have to look for something and things you can look for. The sun still rises. The sun still rises. Uh, even on the stormiest days and it's cloudy and it's dark, beyond the clouds, the sun's still shining. Uh, I think of Viktor Frankl. I think you have an affinity for Viktor Frankl and how he found, you know, a, a, a flower blooming in the prison yard of the concentration camp. Oh, wow. I'm grateful for that. Right, those little things, the kindness of someone, right? That, like Brad Aronson talked about. So there are these things that we can find and choose to be grateful for, and it helps us get through those difficulties. And maybe at some point in time, in retrospect, you have way more gratitude about the situation even, right? You find the redemptive elements even of your darkest, hardest situation. But it's not somebody pointing a finger and, you know, so this is what I, I don't want to should on any, you should be grateful, right? Some of us probably learn that, right? I talk about, I have a framework. The way I first learned gratitude was obligation. You should be grateful, son. I don't want. I don't want to know. I don't want to know gratitude is an obligation because it's either should or guilt, right? There's just nothing. But if we keep going on that journey from obligation, some people teach gratitude as a hack. There's so much on the internet about gratitude being a life hack. And footnote: it is a life hack. When I'm having a bad day, or if I find myself in a rut. I know the best way to get out of that is to just immerse myself into gratitude. R write gratitude notes. Write the longest list of gratitude I've ever written, right? And think, how many things can I come up to be grateful for today? But just don't stop with it being a hack. And if you continue on that journey, then you, you look at gratitude and you go, oh, I want it to become a practice or I want it to become a habit. And then if we continue, it becomes mindset. And Randy, if we stay in that journey long enough, it becomes lifestyle. And, and what I observe is that that as I'm on that in that process of doing what you've described, of implementing and choosing gratitude, my circumstances haven't necessarily changed. So I, I laugh and my wife say, you know, nothing's changed, but everything has everything. changed. Right. I say that so often. Nothing's yeah. changed. Everything's changed. Why? Because Go ahead. I've changed. It's because yeah. I see, and and it's it's perspective. It's I have changed. I see things differently. That's how everything's changed. I have a completely new lens. There's funny. I, I mentioned this in a previous podcast, but there's there's this funny image of perspective where there's kind of a three D shape in the center of a room, and there's there's light, and the the shadows that are cast from three different angles are three different shapes, and every single one of them is is correct. But if you change your perspective, what you see completely changes. So that's one of the things I say at the beginning as I'm just introducing to people to gratitude. Two things I say, a couple, always, I use a definition of gratitude that comes from my, a friend. She wrote a wonderful journal called Life's Not All Strawberries and Cream, But There Are Some Wonderful Moments, Patty Blackstaff. And she gave me permission to use her definition. Gratitude is appreciation for all that we have all that we are, and thankfulness for our ability to show love and kindness to others. I love that definition because for the first many decades of my life, I only understood the first definition, that gratitude was appreciation for the blessings of life, the stuff, right? And that's how I process gratitude. The other thing I 
I use a couple of other quotes. Uh, we don't see the world as it is. We see it as we are. Aeneas Nin and Wayne Dyer said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So gratitude is the ultimate tool we have for shifting perspective. I love that. There's, there's no, I think it's the fastest way to change. I think I that agree. we, that we can, we can in an instant be affected by some event or trauma can we just as quickly hack out of that and intentionally choosing gratitude can change that completely i i, I believe it expands us to be able to allow that possibility and th this has been so fun kevin you know before we we end i i hadn't planned on asking this but but hopefully this will be good do you have a recommend do you have an invitation that you could give to our listeners one thing that can increase their gratitude and hope today yes so let me think of which one to offer one thing that i believe is guaranteed is to look back over this week of your life even the last 24 48 hours who is someone that has brightened your day or lightened your load and send them a text now and thank them for what they did. So the, I recently learned a word. There's a word, watashiato. It comes from the Dictionary of Obscure Words. It may be a bit of a made-up word, but watashiato is people are curious about the impact they've, their life has had on others, right? And how the events of my life may have influenced someone else. Well, people shouldn't be wondering. We should be telling people you made a difference in my life. And Randy, when people communicate gratitude to someone else for that amazing thing they did, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that somewhere between 85, 90% of the time, the person had no idea that what they did impacted you in that way. So when you tell them, you're giving them a gift. And usually the response you get in return is a gift back to you, right? So if you just pause and if you express sincere, okay, so, and if you want to express gratitude, here's how we teach. It, it, significant gratitude is simple, sincere, and specific, right? So it, it's simple. It, it doesn't have to be robust language. It doesn't have to be long. It does need to be sincere. If you don't mean it, just don't say it. But if you can give some kind of, when you did this, okay, so I have a friend, and we talk about nudges, and every once in a while, I just feel nudged to send him a text, and he he's a guy that has a lot on the ball, right, and he's he, he, he does mindfulness work, and he works to stay on the right side of things in life, <coughs> as do I, but when I feel a nudge to call him, text him, or when he, we usually need that boost at that moment, right? Even people that have the tools, the skills, stuff happens, as you said. So when, when you feel that nudge, just send them a text. Just place the call, whatever it is, take action on it. And more likely than not, they will respond and it will lift your framework. The other, and then do it again tomorrow. And that do it again is a tomorrow. wonderful invitation. That is the best way to end this. Kevin, this has been such a fun conversation. And listeners, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. You could be anywhere else right now, and you chose to join this conversation, which means so much. We are grateful for you because you make this possible. And gratitude is saving my life as we're having these conversations. So thank you. Kevin, you do amazing work. Thank you for helping people find hope, find gratitude and connection. You're amazing. Thank you, Randy. This was such a joy. And I'll just echo what Randy said. Thank you for joining us. All right. We'll see you next time, everyone. Bye-bye.